Kira koutou katoa. Good afternoon. Today I'm joined by Biosecurity and Agriculture Minister Damien O'Connor to talk about the action the government is taking to protect New Zealand's economy from foot and mouth disease and what we need New Zealanders to do to keep our agricultural sector safe. But first to the week ahead. I'm in Wellington on Tuesday and Wednesday attending question time in the House. On Tuesday evening, I will attend and speak at the Business New Zealand's Backing Business event. On Thursday, I have events in Otaki and live in. On Friday, I have events in Auckland. On that weekend, we will look to highlight the next steps in our work on HIV. In May, foot and mouth disease was detected in Indonesia and a few weeks ago in its tourist capital of Bali. It has been a priority of our government to strengthen our biosecurity system investing a further $110 million in Budget 2022 to ensure we have one off, if not the strongest system in the world, to protect us from diseases like this, to preserve both our unique biodiversity and our agricultural sector, worth over $52 billion to our economy. While the World Organisation for Animal Health estimates the virus is present in 77% of the world's livestock population, New Zealand has never had an outbreak and we want to do all we can to keep it that way. This is a new outbreak in Indonesia, which they are still working to manage, so it's important that we adjust for this new risk. Foot and mouth has been present in other countries for some time, and our tough biosecurity uh, settings have so far kept it out. While not a threat to humans, it would devastate our national herd. Essentially, all animals with, who are cloven hooved are at risk, cows, sheep, pigs, goats, deer and llama. In the event of foot and mouth reaching New Zealand, all trade in animal products would be stopped and rural businesses such as farms, farm contractors, animal processors and transporters would be affected. Animals would be slaughtered and more than 100,000 jobs in the primary sector would be at risk. Early detection of the disease would be vital to respond quickly and eradicate as soon as possible, if possible, and resume trade in animal products. And while no system is foolproof, we can and will increase measures where there is even the lowest risk of foot and mouth entering New Zealand. And part of that is ensuring every New Zealander plays their part too. And so while there are no direct flights from Indonesia to New Zealand, even the slightest potential for increased risk means we escalate our defences quickly. Biosecurity New Zealand has stopped travellers from bringing any personal consignments of any meat products from Indonesia and has installed disinfected foot mats for all arrivals from Indonesia. They also undertook an audit last month of Indonesia's palm kernel supply chain, which found it is meeting New Zealand's strict biosecurity requirements for foot and mouth disease. New Zealand has also provided Indonesia with PPE, disinfectant sprayers and other tools, as well as technical expertise to help them manage their outbreak. We've also been in continual contact with Australia too, where last week some trace viral fragments, not transmissible, were found on processed pork product there. I want in particular today to also acknowledge the primary sector groups who have been running awareness campaigns, and I want to echo what they have been saying to try and help spread that message to as many New Zealanders as possible. This is the prime time to promote further awareness about the threat of foot and mouth, what you can do to follow good biosecurity practice and what to look out for. And so, to all New Zealanders and travellers here, please be responsible, please be honest and thorough in your biosecurity declarations as you return from overseas travel. Crucially, if you've interacted with animals in a country known to have foot and mouth, then you must stay away from farms for a week and that includes lifestyle blocks. For further uh, messaging that we are sharing, particularly with our primary sector, I'm going to hand over to Minister O'Connor. Uh, kia ora. Look, thank you, Prime Minister. And uh, foot and mouth disease has been always considered the doomsday disease uh, for the New Zealand farming sector. We've been aware of its threats for decades, and some of us may, may remember the horrific scenes from the UK uh, some time ago where hundreds of thousands of animals had to be slaughtered. Uh, we have, thankfully, strong and multi-layered uh, systems, uh, biosecurity systems, arguably some of the strongest in the world, and, but we must have an approach of continually improving them. Um, we have made significant investments in biosecurity, $110 million more, $21 million of which has gone into critical diagnostic, 
uh, surveillance and investigative cap capability and heightened, heightened readiness uh, for diseases like foot and mouth disease uh, should they ever arrive in our country. Uh, vigilance is absolutely crucial and the public awareness campaign that we have been running over the last few weeks now is to raise the awareness across the whole of the population. Uh, we've been doing risk assessments, including on all arrivals in cargo, 100% of which is all checked uh, in bag and cabbage and, and cargo. 100% of it is checked coming in. We've got detector dogs, uh, and we've got very high, strong import health standards. And as the Prime Minister said, we have stopped any importation of food from people from Indonesia. Indonesia. Um, look, the speed of any response, of course, in a preparedness situation uh, will rely on traceability and records. We have learnt much from the um, Mycoplasma bovis campaign and farmers generally now are adhering to a very high standard of NAIT record keeping and that is great. But we will be saying to them, if you see any of your cattle, sheep, deer, pigs, goats, or alpacas, llamas, uh, with any symptoms of high fever, uh, of mouth and feet blisters, or erosions and lameness, then please call. It's important that farmers remind all their staff and anyone working around farms uh, of this possibility. But I've been having uh, regular uh, discussions, of course, with my staff, but also with beef and lamb with other uh, industry organisations. Uh, I can say that in the event of uh, foot and mouth ever reaching here, uh, we have access to a vaccine bank in the UK that can be called upon within days of notice. But we hope uh, with vigilance, uh, with improved systems and with all the efforts that we've put in so far, we won't have to face uh, foot and mouth in New Zealand. Kira. Okay, happy to take questions. Um, Prime yeah. Minister, um Parents are telling us that unless there is a mask mandate, children simply won't... Do you mind, Amelia, if I just cast around? I, I try not to hold ministers for longer than is necessary. If I just cast around, then I'll come straight back to you once we go through. Any foot and mouth related uh, questions from the gallery? How would you describe the risk um, given, I suppose, the proximity now to New Zealand despite these controls and what else could you do? Is there a step up that mm -hmm. you could take um, if, if the risk... Increases. Uh, look, I couldn't put a figure on that other than to say the risk has increased and obviously we know many Australians go to Bali, many Australians come to New Zealand and while we don't have direct flights, the possibility of it coming through Australia is there. Uh, we're working with Australian authorities to make sure that they have the most robust uh, border systems in place and we're sharing the best knowledge and best practice across the Tasman. And are there other steps you could do in terms of Australian transactions or comings and goings if that's going to be a, a risk? Uh, look, you know, yes, uh, Australians obviously in, in growing numbers will be going to Bali, their borders are open. Uh, that does heighten the risk into that country and then across here. One of the things we have to be mindful of, of course, is uh, through third countries such as the Pacific. So we'll be watching all borders uh, and, and testing um, any of the incoming baggage, of course, uh, that may be at risk, asking questions of anyone who may have been uh, connected in primary or secondary ways with Indonesia. I think uh, that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we're working closely with Australia and their biosecurity teams, uh, because it's of course not only the direct risk of importation uh, of products, and particularly obviously you've heard we've um, taken a close look at PKE for that reason. Uh, we're also of course concerned about the major uh, migratory routes for people uh, to travel into New Zealand from Indonesia, and that obviously would usually or often be via Australia. Um, but that's where we're working closely um, together in a trans-Tasman way to make sure that we reduce down that risk for both of us. Um, so what about yeah. the ports, though? Is that a yep. concern as well? Yes. Uh, yeah, every container is being inspected, any from Indonesia. Um, very mindful of the, the risks from other countries to foot and mouth disease, and we'll mm. continue to um, do those assessments and upgrade the systems where necessary. Mm. Uh, is Australia, uh, I'll just come to Bernard, then come over to you, Luke. Uh, Minister, are, are you considering um, blocking any uh, food imports, in particular pork, given it was pork uh, products into Australia that were, that were found to have to put them out? We're conducting the same survey as Australia has of some supermarkets where um, product has come in, um, perhaps from Indonesia, Indonesia or other countries that have foot and mouth disease, to see whether there are any DNA remnants or any other risks. Um, but it's a low-risk pathway, but we are still investigating. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes yeah, to, uh, you say every container from Indonesia is being inspected, what, what, what does an inspection mean? Mm -hmm. 
Infection means basically, um, you know, there's an outbreak of the in disease. Infection. So inspection. Sorry. Uh, inspection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all no, containers no, no. coming in will have someone there on site to ensure that, that when it's opened, um, we can look for any risk products into that. So mm -hmm. just for all the containers from Indonesia at the moment, uh, we don't do that for all containers, but we do up the, the management systems and the checks whenever we see a, a heightened risk from anywhere. So risk, so risk products might be any sort of agricultural or products, products or something. Absolutely, and, and then how is that? How is that inspected? How is it scanned? Or what happens? Look, there'll be people on site who'll be looking for any risks. Uh, clearly, some of those containers may have come from rural areas, so it's not just the contents, mm -hmm. but it is actually at the outside of the containers as well and where they've been sourced from. Mm -hmm. um, just two questions by now on this. On this, yeah, go ahead. In, in Australia, the debate is around whether the border should be shut to Indonesia. Would you ever consider a radical measure like that? And, and secondarily, I mean, people have a lot of choice um, in where they might choose to holiday. Would you encourage them just not to holiday in Bali at the moment? Uh, well, obviously, uh, not having those direct flights means that we have intermediary steps in order to try and ensure that we've got those protective mechanisms in place. Uh, we are, of course, scanning all luggage from those who may have been in the area. Uh, we have foot baths for those who may have been in the area and very clear guidance and expectations on anyone who have been in certain parts or engaged in certain practices like visiting rural areas. I think, again, uh, when it comes to the idea of border closures, there's no question that this poses a significant biosecurity risk to New Zealand, but at the same time, when you have estimates of up to 77% of the wildlife po of the population who might be susceptible to foot and mouth uh, being uh, uh, potentially in contact with it around the world, it just demonstrates that that risk is, is a general one as well. We're heightening here our response because this is an, uh, an emerging uh, a disease in a country that has not previously recorded it. Uh, and therefore, we want to make sure that we've got all our settings in place to protect ourselves against that new emerging threat in that part of the world. Minister, um, yeah. so that there used to be direct flights to Indonesia from New Zealand. Are you aware of any plans to... Um, to bring those back, and would this obviously affect that? Yeah, not at, uh, not at this stage, but you're right that there's obviously a scaling up of accessibility for different parts of the world, uh, and what we'd need to make sure, it, if that were the case, that we have those adequate biosecurity checks uh, in, in place. Again, point out that there are parts of the world where we do have direct connections that already have foot and mouth um, present. Uh, where we have, of course, had to establish uh, protocols to ensure, again, that we have that, uh, those mechanisms in place. And we need to think not just about travel, but the movement of, of goods. Um, and as the Minister has said, it's not just an agricultural product, but it's anything that might be derived from those areas which could be seen as potentially um, a point of transmission. Yeah. Um, the Minister uh, talked about it being a doomsday scenario, potentially, for agriculture. Can you put any sort of figure on the percentage that GDP in New Zealand might drop as a result of an outbreak and, and, and just talk about the economic impacts? Yeah. Yeah, look, there has been a figure. I, it, it, it's reasonably significant, and mm -hmm. I, can't put, I can't quote that now. You can probably go and investigate that. One of the big challenges, if, if it was to come into New Zealand, is the wildlife. We have mm -hmm. proven wildlife that would make it difficult. Uh, the UK, of course, most of the animals uh, were on a farm situation. Um, that's why it's more important that we keep this out so that it not only in, you know, is prevented from infecting farm animals but then getting into the wildlife. Wild deer, becoming, wild pigs, wild goats. Yeah. Becoming really I could see someone was picturing wild, wild cows. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So that there is, are a few on the West Coast. Yeah. So that is, that is a significant additional threat for New Zealand. Of course, Mycoplasma bovis, there's an example where New Zealand is on track to do something that no one else has done by eradicating that disease. I say on track because it takes a number of years for us to fully determine and us to enable those um, the testing over certain times in the calendar where the animals are stressed and it's more likely to manifest. But with foot and mouth, there's extra challenges there, and so that makes it um, additionally risky. Yeah. Okay, a similar eradication approach, I take it. Oh, look, you know, my, my view would be, you know, do as much as you can to protect the herd. Uh, and so we've got to do what we can to protect it from coming in. Uh, and I would want to uh, fully, um, you know, if it was an early detection, do everything that we could to try and get rid of it. Action would have to be swifter yeah. and, and more dramatic. Yeah. Biosecurity New Zealand has estimated a $10 billion reduction in export revenue. Mm. There was a foot-mouth uh, outbreak. Does, does that... 
Is that in line with what you've been advised? Yeah. Yeah. It's a figure I have seen, and I, again, people make estimates, uh, yeah. but it, it is a significant hit to our economy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's everything. Thank you, right. Minister O'Connor. Uh, Amelia. Thank you. Um, parents are telling us today that unless there is a mask mandate, children simply won't wear masks, even if the school strongly encourages it. So is there any room for you changing your mind on issuing a mandate for school? Keep in mind, a school can also require it. So I think here I would say ministers came at this issue with a very open mind. You know, we want to do everything that we can to, of course, protect our kids and protect our health system. So we asked our experts in health and education to provide us with their best advice uh, on whether or not we should move back to government mandating masks. The response we clearly got was that education uh, wanted the flexibility to implement a policy that of course does not preclude and we are strongly encouraging schools uh, to utilise masks, we're providing them and they can require their use but this at least allows schools to implement it in a way that works for their school community. Secondary principles are calling for the government to make it easier to hire teachers from overseas as COVID bites because relievers are in such short supply. What are you doing to um, get teachers here yeah. quickly? We have had recruitment campaigns. Um, I, I, you would forgive me, I'd want to go back and check about this on the status um, of those. Uh, and even indeed on some of the numbers we've had because we had had specific campaigns, particularly in those areas where we have had shortages in the past. There are particular subjects where we've often uh, had a large number of vacancies or difficulties in some harder to staff parts of the country. But I wouldn't mind going away and then checking what some of those vacancies are looking like. One, 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 one thing that schools have asked for, Last one, which would... Um, which they say would significantly speed up the process and make it cheaper for them is for rubber stamping every state school so they don't have to apply to their accredited employers. Is there going to be any wriggle room well, on the, changing that? Yeah, again, so here, if you'd allow me to go on, because the accredited employer scheme does allow at least, for instance, in health, uh, we have Health NZ working in that capacity. So you've got the ability to really centralise a system, which makes it a lot smoother and a lot easier. But again, I'd like to go back and just have a quick look at the way that education are implementing that new scheme. Jane? How do you look at the political donations regime again, especially with legislation before the House at the moment, in terms of the definition of political yeah. donation? Yeah. Because at the moment, as the judgment mm. would suggest, yeah. is you could funnel that money through a shadow yeah. entity at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and so here, uh, if I can just separate out my comments from that particular case, because uh, you know there is the potential there for potentially appeals to occur. I think if it's uh, if we have an illustration of where the intent or the principle of any of our electoral laws is not necessarily being upheld in the spirit in which it was potentially intended by Parliament, you would want an avenue to go and look at that. The the op opportunity that we have is that we have two bills going through, well, two processes. One is that we're already trying to increase the transparency around donations, but the other is the independent review around electoral laws generally. Uh, that has the scope and capacity to pick up any issues that might come out from court cases around electoral donations. Ultimately, I think all parties, it's in our best interest uh, to have laws and systems in place that people have faith uh, and trust in. And so if we see anything that demonstrates that we could strengthen that, I would like to use that opportunity as a parliament and try and build consensus too. That you would use this legislation, the review's not due until after the next election, so that would be too late. And this would suggest a very, very big loophole and public trust and in terms of um, the ability for foreign interference, will you use the legislation now before the next election to have another look at it potentially? So the two pieces we have, we've obviously, uh, you will have seen in June, we've already announced some changes around uh, the electoral uh, laws that relate to political donations and loans. So that requires the disclosure of donor identities for any donations over 5,000 the number and total value of party donations under 1,500 that um, are not made anonymously, the proportion of total party donations that are in kind, and loans to candidates from unregistered lenders. If we have, as a consequence of any of the court's um, cases that we see uh, currently, and I speak generally here because some of them may not have been completed, uh, anything that demonstrates that the this law as it was intended has issues, then I would want to see us respond to that. 
Uh, the issue likely there being that the drafting of that, I imagine, uh, may be somewhat more complex. Even if you introduce something tomorrow or intended to introduce something tomorrow, uh, I would say the amount of time required may make it tight for 2023. Taking all of that into into account, is there something now in the regime that should be given greater attention than this time last week? Uh, perhaps if you could ask me that question again once uh, we see this court case fully uh, completed, because my concern at the moment is I'm 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 loath to go too far down the track in determining what needs to change in the law before we've had an appeal. There if there is one. If there was a significant problem with the definition of political donations... Oh, as then, I say, I think you will hear me say, if the spirit of the law, and you would assume that the spirit of the law as it's intended, if we see examples of where that is that is being found to be uh, uh, not having held in practice, then you would expect Parliament to want to respond to that. Are still saying that the legislative process might be too quick and, and not... Um, Considered enough to make such a substantial change, even if that had come to put, even if that had come to attention as a problem, and yeah, it would have so, to be dealt with by the review. Uh, I think that that would be that would still be the most timely way to deal with this because at the moment we have one piece of legislation that's already already quite well advanced. And of course, as you know, the process of uh, working through the complexity of electoral laws, and we have seen examples where it's been done quickly and badly. No, but does, Mr. Sorry, just finally, doesn't the fact though that there's an election between then and now actually give greater urgency to not leaving it with that review? Yeah, but you're assuming that if we did it separately, that we would still get it done before the election. I'm casting some doubt on that. Uh, if you look at every cycle where we've made changes to electoral law, when I say we, um, a government of the day, usually it's as a consequence of a select committee review after the election, uh, the Ministry of Justice picking up those responses, drafting um, via um, PCO and then bringing back before the House, and it has almost always taken a full three-year cycle, if not more. Uh, I think even if you were to identify an issue and your intention was to try and introduce it before the next election, you would have to do it with a reduced process, and, and that is an area where I would worry that we would that we would make mistakes. So, is there will? Yes, absolutely. You know, you can already see as a government we are moving to try and improve these laws, improve transparency, improve tr public confidence. If we have court cases that demonstrate that there are issues, we will respond to them. But we also want to do it in a way that we get it right. Well, yes, I'll come to Jessica then. Um, uh, then Jason. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Chloe Swarbrick has just ruled herself out of any leadership um, contest. Sorry, sorry, what was it? Chloe Swarbrick oh, has ruled herself out of any leadership contest with the Greens. How damaging is it that your political partner is having to go through this? Uh, look, you know, ultimately uh, the uh, political rules of any party, it's always a, a, a matter for them. Uh, the question, of course, that is relevant for us as a government was, does it change any of the ministerial portfolios or the jobs of any of our ministers? And the answer is, it doesn't. And so that means, in my mind, that this is an issue squarely for the Greens. They are a partner of yours, though, so it does impact you in the sense that if they're not doing so well, that doesn't um, do so well for you when you start adding up the maths to get to that 61 needed to form a government. So... The fact that they're talking about this, is that frustrating for you? Well, there's nothing to suggest in their polling that they aren't. In fact, as I recall, I think they might be doing better now than they even did at the election. Uh, and so, look, you know, ultimately, hypotheticals about uh, an election right now, we're getting on with governing. The inc most important thing for us is that we continue on with what is a significant agenda on climate work. Uh, and as I've said, I have full confidence in Minister Shaw in that area, and I have no intention of changing. What would you like to work with? You would have heard me talk probably, you know, a reasonable degree um, on the work of Minister Shaw, and that's because he has a portfolio that is really significant to us as a government. You know, my decision to put him into that portfolio when we uh, formed government wasn't because we needed a relationship um, to able to form government with the Greens strictly, although I do think it's important to keep that going. It was because I actually believed he was the right person for the job. Uh, he has uh, an incredible understanding of a very complex area. He works hard to build relationships in an area where we need this policy to stick for the generations to come and not change because of election cycles. 
And in my mind, he has helped us as a government to make the most significant changes in climate action that any government has made. Um, former yeah. former um, Green MP Catherine Delahunty described him as a Labour lap dog. Would, how would you react to that characterisation? Oh, look, and again, I don't want to get into the discussion that might be happening amongst members of the Green Party. All I can do is reflect on uh, the minister that I've worked alongside in a professional capacity uh, as the person that presides over a cabinet and a wider ministry. And my reflection would simply be that, as you would expect, uh, a minister who is a member of the Green Party, uh, he advocates for climate action that is in keeping with his values and principles. And you would expect that. Um, but I push back very hard on any suggestion that as a government, we have not been ambitious. Has climate uh, action and policy been more ambitious as a result of uh, James Shaw being the climate change minister than if a Labour minister were, were in that Well, way. here I would like to point out that I would, you know, that I believe that Labour came in with a, you know, a significant agenda ourselves around climate action. Where I think we've had uh, a definitely value add is this is a highly complex area. And we had a minister who had been in this portfolio for three years, building his knowledge, understanding and plan for the future. And it enabled a continuity that's been really important to us. Do we have uh, climate-minded ministers in the Labour Party and people who feel passionate about climate action? Absolutely. But I believe that, yes, I do believe that Minister Shaw has value add. Is he from another party? And is that clear in the work we do with him? Yes. But I also believe that there is the benefit to New Zealand of him also holding such a position. Just on the topic of the uh, Yeah, oh, I might just bounce around, Jason, and then come back to you. Bernard, and who else did I have? No, OK, Bernard. Prime Minister, um, can the Greens um, actually change a Labor policy or change a Labor government policy when it can only ever be um, a partner for a Labor government? as James Shaw said, I, he doesn't have any leverage, so why would you do anything extra for the Greens? Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, here I would argue that you've got examples in the past where uh, votes haven't necessarily been needed from the Green Party, but it hasn't changed the fact that there has been... Uh, you know, policies adopted as a result of their, them being in Parliament. But in my mind, do they affect greater change by being a part of governments? Yes, I do, but that's my, that's my perspective. Um, obviously, example. others may hold different perspectives. An example, we're actually having... Oh, just when I'm, I mean, in the past, when they've partnered with the National Party on things like insulation schemes and the like. So there, well, there was an example of where they necessarily didn't, weren't required for votes, but they still advocated for positions and policy changes that were then implemented. So to, to do something different than what we've done. Well, to do something, yeah, and again, this is, I think this is much more nuanced here. When you are a member of a cabinet, of course, you know, your job is to advocate strongly for the policy areas that you hold responsibility for, um, to bring an evidence base to the table, to work with your stakeholders to affect change. Uh, and so all ministers, of course, do that as part of a government. And of course, you would expect uh, the Minister for Climate Change to do the same. If you're asking me to differentiate, therefore, whether or not as a result the policies are markedly different than they might otherwise be for a Labour Minister, it's very hard for me to make that differentiation. But in my view, Minister Shaw does make a significant contribution to this government, even though he is not a member of the governing party. Can you guarantee James yeah. Shaw's job in, uh, as climate change minister, even if he's not co-leader? Yes, Do yes. I was very explicit um, when we set out the agreement um, in, the, uh, in the very beginning of the term of office that I didn't want an arrangement that meant foregoing uh, the uh, role that any prime minister has to determine who holds ministerial warrants. So if you had an agreement that said whoever the co-leaders are are the ministers, in my mind that took away what has traditionally always been the prerogative of a prime minister. And so that's why we were very clear that they were named as individuals. Well, my, question, my question was, oh, sorry. Um, do you offer the same guarantees to Marvin Davidson and how do you think she's performing in her role? Yeah, again, it's the same principle and I stand by that. And I equally believe that Marvin Davidson brings a lot to the table in the role that she plays in an area that is has traditionally been very, very difficult. Just 
thing on the, the just on to the, keep. Ah, I can't, I'll come over here to Sam and then come back. Sorry, I did say I'll come over here to Sam. If it's greens related, I'll, I'll leave it again. Okay. This is something different. Okay. Jason? Oh, it is greens related, but it's about the green level setting, so. Oh. <laughs> That's <what it's> nice. <laughs> I like That's what you did there. We'll go then to Jessica, Sam, and then Jason. Um, is that because you're not keen to work with Chloe Swarbrick? No, no. As I say, this was a decision I made at the time that the agreement was constructed. It was not about any individual, but really importantly, preserving that principle um, that, uh, of course, Prime Ministers of the day across different um, parties have always preserved, and that is that it's the PM who determines who the ministers are. And so that's what we've worked to preserve. That's not about personalities. Um, that's about always having that ability to make those decisions. There's been some pretty shocking uh, political violence in Papua New Guinea around mm. the elections. Mm. Uh, uh, are you looking at, is the government looking at offering any sort of support, peacekeeping, police or, or stability? How yeah. How and are you in that situation? Uh, so, uh, we uh, have plans to observe counting um, actually today and tomorrow in certain, uh, a certain province. Uh, and we also have the New Zealand Observer Team, uh, which is made up of one, two, three, four, five, five different um, individuals plus High Commission and MFAT staff, and that includes a couple of sitting members of, of Parliament. Uh, and we have also provided electoral support to PNG. Uh, the current five-year program has a budget of $6.9 million. So I think it is fair to say we've been um, uh, very open around the role that we can play there. It's in our interest to support our Pacific neighbours uh, with uh, crucial points in their democracy, such as this one. Um, we've also uh, positively responded to a request to fund flying hours to support the movement of electoral materials. And I believe Australia has similarly provided a, um, ADF assets as well. Curtailing violence. There's been a number of deaths, I think hundreds or thousands of injuries. Do we need to do something in, in that space beyond sort of just election transparency? And here, of course, you'll see that we are often, you know, uh, very much leave ourselves available to requests that are made uh, in security concerns when they are raised, often, as you would expect in that part of the world, often alongside Australia. I'm not aware of specific requests, so if you don't mind, I might just check with um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to see if they're being received. Um, so, did you have something on that, Luke? Uh, no. Yeah, OK, so I'll come to Jason. That's all right, you can go on. Uh, the um, LGNZ has suggested that the three waters transition be phased and stormwater integration possibly be delayed uh, further yeah. for, uh, for bespoke arrangement with councils. Yeah. What's your, what, what's your view on that? Is it yeah, that, so, I read, uh, so I've read some of the statements made by, um, by LGNZ and what's, what's certainly clear from my takeaway is that there wasn't a suggestion that this suddenly moved to a two waters regime. I think that there's an acknowledgement uh, of the interaction um, between stormwater and wastewater in, in many parts of the system and so on. Uh, here, again, they've made a submission. Uh, let's allow that to be prosecuted at select committee and teased out at select committee. Um, but obviously, not taking there's not a suggestion here that it be um, carved off in its entirety and for the long term, but a transition. Uh, I, I haven't seen an, enough of the detail around that, that proposal, though. So, so there's a possibility there could be a bit of movement around it, but not, but not changing the overall thrust of the reform. But nor have I heard them necessarily suggest an overall thrust, it seems to me, transition arrangements. So here I think it's best that I just leave it to select committee. Um, Prime Minister, on yeah, the, the green alert level setting, could yeah. you just run us through if anything has changed as to what Cabinet needs to see before you put New Zealand back into that setting or whether that setting still actually exists and then when we'll be moving to lower restrictions, we'll just be going back to a what has been described as business as no usual or will we have another set of alert? Yeah, good question. We've made no changes and nor have we made any decisions around uh, changing uh, the COVID protection framework in the future. Um, what we will want to do in the future though is just do a general check as we have all the way through to say, okay, this was established at the beginning of an Omicron uh, outbreak, um, but actually some time ago, um, pre actually. And so let's just check in the future that that's fit for purpose. We're not at that point yet. Our focus at the moment is getting through winter. There will be a specific BA5 
set of restrictions? No, not necessarily. I think what we need to do is just make sure our systems constantly evolve. Um, but that's actually been the approach we've taken all the way through COVID. Just make sure the system's fit for purpose. But at the moment, as I'd say, big focus is continuing to support the health system to get through what is a very difficult period as a result of multiple uh, seasonal illnesses. And I don't think now is the time to change that, that underlying system. But what would you need to see or what would Cabinet need to see to lower either the current settings that we have or move us something back to what was business as usual? Yeah, you'll remember that one of the major considerations for us was pressure on the health system. So obviously we're not in that place at the moment. Yep. Bloomfield um, asked for, has been asking for advice around the red setting, changes to the red setting. Has he given you any advice or reports on that? I'll leave that to Minister Verrill, but it is fair to say that we constantly kind of look at all of those settings. You'll know that there's no intention to move up up those settings. We've been asked that a number of times because the view is that the settings that we have uh, with the transmissibility of the illness that we have actually will make a marked difference and even then set us apart from a number of other countries. It's a matter of people using them. So vaccines, um, masks and isolation when you're sick. Uh, we do have another um, check-in uh, coming up uh, this uh, was it just at the beginning of August? We've got another review of where the settings are at, and you'll know that we look at isolation periods for that as well. Uh, so that's coming up soon. So the cabinet is looking at isolation. And there was another. Oh, we contacted. That's not new. We we just we built it into the cycle. So every time we look at our settings, we look at the isolation periods. Yeah. Another jump in hospitalisation. Um, yeah. Today. Yeah. So, so in that, so I have asked officials about that. Just a little bit more information, um, because uh, two things to say. I think one is hospitalisations lag by about two weeks from case numbers. So even when case numbers come away, it takes us about two weeks to see that really shift in our hospital numbers. We're keeping a very close eye on what we see happen to our hospitalisations over the next two weeks particularly because there is a view that it may well be that school holidays have changed potentially the level of reporting on COVID case numbers. We have, however, at the same time seen a, a positive change in wastewater prevalence. So early days yet, and we do want to keep an eye on numbers, but suggestions may be, may be that we might be coming, seeing a, a, a decline in, in cases. Um, on the hospitalisation, though, I do want to take another look over the next three days because we often do see discharges change slightly over the weekend. So it'll be really important to see what happens over the next couple of days. Um, yeah, Mark, then Joe. Do you expect that the CPF will be in, in place, you know, with some changes perhaps, but for the long term? For the um, year, year after? I don't want to predetermine that. Uh, you know, I think one of the important things for us has been um, that we need to be agile, we need to make sure that our system works for whatever version of COVID that we have. Um, and we've had a number of variants now since the CPF was put in place, so I don't want to predetermine that. But I think what's really important, the message now, is that there aren't changes. We're sticking to what we have. And when I look at, for instance, some of the hospitalisations in other countries, I think you can see that actually these measures do make a difference. A couple of months ago when he was still COVID minister, Chris Hipkin said that the the COVID legislation would probably be repealed near the end of the year. Is that still on the cards or would you expect to have some sort of new, something to, to uh, you know, provide the basis for the traffic light system or whatever? Yeah, so if the decision of course is made that we need to continue these on, you need the legislative footing uh, to do that. Uh, and so I think one of the pieces of work we're having to look at is to make sure that we're using the right tools in the right way. Um, but. Perhaps a question for Dr. Vero when we when we do the general routine um, update on uh, settings. Jo? What is your comfort level around um, indoor gatherings at the moment? Because just by way of example, you're obviously speaking at what will be a reasonably large event uh, tomorrow night, the business NZ function. But yeah. then at the same time, later this week, there was meant to be another business function here at Parliament. Um, which has been postponed because of COVID and the concerns around that. So you are seeing organisers reacting differently at the moment as to whether to go ahead with these sorts of things. Yeah, I think one of the things they're also factoring in is just absence as well. So whether or not people are available. So that's another thing that I think is factoring in. Well then, I mean, do, do you expect that you will wear a mask 
when you're at the Business New Zealand event? Or yeah. how are you treating these indoor large gatherings? Yeah, and so, look, you know, uh, what we ask people to do is follow is to follow the rules, and of course, when it is an event where food and drink is available, then obviously, you know, we've never asked people to try and juggle the consumption of food and um, and uh, uh, drink simultaneously. People will, of course, there within those contexts, make their judgment around how they manage that. But one of the things that we are aware of, though, and when we've asked to look at impacts of gathering limits, that actually in order to have a marked effect on transmission for some of these new variants, you basically gathering limits would be, you know, would be vastly different than what they are now. And the view continues to be that the settings that we have are the most appropriate settings for the circumstances we have now. Um, and that is, uh, uh, of course, mass use uh, and so on, as I've already set out. So, look, here you do see people using their discretion within those rules. And, again, people will act in a way where they're comfortable, um, but I think the guidance is, is still appropriate. In terms of the data that you've um, been looking at with cases, yeah. um, do you expect that uh, school holidays will have been a bit of a circuit breaker for cases? Well, again, I, I'd prefer a modeler to, to make those to make those judgments, uh, because it is when you look at international um, examples, uh, it does seem that the B four B five waves haven't been as large as the ori original waves of Omicron, um, but at the same time, uh, there aren't, I believe, as many countries now who are perhaps recording as much as New Zealand continues to record. And this is a really interesting space then that we're in, and nor are they in, um, obviously, all, uh, all of them in a winter. And so because of those differences, we're not necessarily comparing apples and apples anymore, so it's hard to know what different events impacts are having on New Zealand numbers or whether or not it's what you might have expected to happen anyway. But again, I wouldn't mind just asking a modeler to say whether or not they think that the school holidays have... Time will tell. If we see another uptick, then it will suggest that school holidays did give any consideration to perhaps, given it is the, the middle of winter, extending um, the school holidays at all, if you thought no. that might be useful? No, no, um, no consideration of that. In fact, some of the clear advice given to us previously um, uh, was that we need to always be careful to weigh up the, 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 the social impacts of children. Um, and, and deferring their ability to attend school. And so the advice then, of course, was to implement the things that we have. So we're strongly encouraging mask use. We've distributed free masks to students and they're available for teachers. We're also paying schools more to enable them to open up their windows in winter to encourage ventilation. All of those things make a difference. So you're back in the house tomorrow yeah. after travelling a fair bit recently. Are you looking forward to cracking into the domestic political context? Given your I only missed one sitting week, didn't I? <laughs> A long stretch of travel and whatnot. Hmm. Like, are you looking forward to cracking back into the domestic political contest given national have taken a bit of um, momentum in recent months? Well, <laughs> without digging into some of the context of that question, I think what I'd say is that even when uh, I'm promoting New Zealand's trade interests offshore, uh, I'm never far from domestic issues, uh, even if I'm in a slightly different location for a short period of time. Yeah, okay, I might come to the last I'm not couple of that. I'm just sort of suggesting, like, are you looking forward to going head to head with Chris Luxon, oh. who's gaining popularity? Oh, oh. <laughs> Again, a number of statements which don't seem to square with some of the polling I've seen. But, <laughs> Jason. Uh, Winston, no comment. <laughs> Winston Peters came out with a, a press release last week about the, and just harking back a little bit, the coalition talks. Um, just kind of um, sitting, there seems to be a bit of confusion as to whether you, asked, you offered him deputy prime ministership in the first day or the last day. <laughs> Are you able to, uh, to tell us just between the two of us? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, look, I will reiterate um, what I have already said, which is whilst I've seen some different recollections of that period, uh, when it comes to the finer detail, I'm going to stick to the confidentiality that I applied at the time, even after the fact. All right. Thank you, everyone.